St. Patrick's Day and we all should be having a lot of fun, but I'm thinking I'm gonna have a lot of fun and I hope you all do too on this panel. I wanna invite each of my panelists that represent the venture community to please join us on stage here. Let's start with Greg and we're just gonna go right down the line. If you could just introduce yourselves a little bit about uh, your, your fund and typical thesis for deploying capital. And then we'll get into a little bit of the programming. Sure, thanks. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, Greg Madden, SV Health Investors, I'm a managing partner at the firm. We're a broad-based healthcare investor investing in everything from seed stage uh, companies to uh, buyouts. We have five fund investing teams uh, across biotech, medtech, healthcare services, healthcare information technology. The firm has um, over $2.3 billion of capital under management. In MedTech, we've got an early stage vehicle, uh, investing typically between five and $8 million in companies over their life. Then we've got a growth equity vehicle that comes behind that, or can invest to Novo in companies investing typically between 15 and 20. Uh, usually those companies have between five and $50 million in revenue. I'm one of two managing partners, and I sit on the investment committee of, of both of those funds. Hi, I'm Dave Kariakis. Uh, I'm with Providence Ventures. First, Scott, thank you. Uh, in a, a great conference uh, so far. Thanks for giving us the opportunity to all get together. It's nice to see everybody again. Um, I work for Providence Ventures. So Providence uh, Ventures represents Providence, uh, one of the third, the third largest health system uh, in the country. They've allocated us 300 million to manage on their behalf. Uh, we look to try and leverage the system, the insights that we can get from uh, all of the various sandboxes that we have to play in. We have 52 acute care hospitals, 1,000 outpatient sites. We're at risk, we're fee for service, we're urban, we're rural. rural. Um, and so we try to identify the problems that are plaguing the health system, uh, identify unique solutions uh, that are being used at, in one of our seven regions to help uh, address those problems and then give it legs and support um, by investing five to 15 million. Uh, we can lead, co-lead, follow, um, but really try and help and uh, leverage the unique insights in the various sandboxes that we have to play in. So, thank you. Uh, hi everyone, this is Lou. I'm the founder managing partner of uh, Fusion Fund. So we're a Silicon Valley based uh, VC firm focused on earlier stage deep tech and healthcare. And within healthcare, we invest a quite a wide range from med tech to uh, AI healthcare to digital life science and digital therapeutics. Typically, we prefer to lead the round and uh, in the C Series A stage and also continue to support the company with our Parada allocation. So in total, we have roughly $300 million under management right now. We also plan to launch a $200 million vehicle to uh, mainly focus on growth stage as well. And myself, I actually was an entrepreneur. I built and ran a medical device company focused on diagnostic of type 2 diabetes, which eventually was acquired by Boston Scientific. After that, I went to the dark side, started, <laughs> to, <laughs> started investing. But we really have the strong mandate to be the true support and, and also friends to the entrepreneur. So I launched the Fusion Fund in 2015. Now we're investing out from our fund three. And I'm Andy McGibbon. I work with Sonder Capital. We're a new fund in the context of Sonder, um, which is really a continuation of some investment activity by a few folks, in particular Jay Watkins, if you saw the panel yesterday morning, and Fred Mall. And so they've been investing in early stage medtech opportunities, mostly devices, um, but kind of looking more broadly at diagnostics and health tech as well. So we took that investment activity they were doing on an ad hoc basis, bundled the team together, and that's when I came on board, and there are now five managing partners. Uh, and we raised a $100 million fund focusing primarily on seed and Series A. Um, you know, letters don't always capture the true spirit of the opportunity, and so we don't really focus on any specific clinical area. We look for really these kind of significant asymmetric opportunities for value creation uh, and kind of try and leverage our background as operators, as innovators, to really help the companies forward. So, Thanks, everybody. We have quite a diverse panel. Um, when I was walking over here to start the panel, somebody grabbed me by the arm and said, David, this is Emerging MedTech Summit. And Scott titled this, What Do VCs Want Now? Can you find out what they really want right now? Um, some people have felt that there's been a little bit kick the can down the road. It's more growth stage. But 
I felt that that wasn't quite appropriate. I have seen some funds that have changed their thesis and theme, but there's still a series A, B, C, there's different investors, but let's talk about what, what specifically you want now, and then what you're seeing in the marketplace as well, because we have four funds represented, but you syndicate, you see a lot of others and where they're looking to go. Andy, you want to start? Um, yeah, sure, I can start. Uh, what do we want right now <laughs> is, is a little bit of a tricky question. I mean, we are operating really at that front stage. So I think the whole impetus for starting Sonder was really seeing that there is a lack of capital and, and support for that capital at those early stages. So um, what we're trying to do is find opportunities that have these kind of, I mentioned this asymmetric concept, but if you look through a checklist of risks, you can have you know yellow in every box with one box red. And for our thesis, that's okay. If you tackle that red risk and it unlocks tremendous value creation, that's okay for us. So we operate across clinical areas. We like things very early where we can partner with the entrepreneur. So, you know, we have everything from ENT to orthodontia to GI to cardiovascular. So, you know, it, it's hard to generalize what we're looking for, but really anything early stage where you're still facing some significant you know, risks moving down the road where you think some operators could bring some expertise and, and support. That's what we're looking for. Yeah, so for us, uh, definitely things we're always looking at is uh, medical device with the platform play. So lots of diagnostic to from cancer, heart disease, mental disease, especially for me personally, I'm super passionate about solution focus on mental disease, not mental well-being, but mental disease related to the aging population. And for things are I would say progressing is we've been investing more and more since uh, 2019 about this workflow efficiency within the healthcare system. I kind of summarize as a technology solution could solve the triple A issue we have in the healthcare sector, accessibility, affordable, and accuracy. So that's something we're kind of relative new, but we're allocating more capital. The last part is even newer. I uh, expanded the team. I actually doubled the size of the team in the past two years. Couple new hire I made are from Genetech and Amgen. So we're more interested in the digital life science and digital therapeutics. David's good online, yeah. Um, so I may give a, a slightly different um, perspective, at least from the health system. So I, I think this is one of the most exciting times to be in healthcare, uh, just because of how disruptive uh, the market is and how health systems are uh, willing to bring on disruption. Uh, the, it may not be surprising, but what we learned over the past two years or so is that the business of delivering care is a losing one. And hospitals, if they are just delivering fee-for-service care, will go out of business. And so you're starting to see new sites of care open up, a transition outside of the towers. Uh, I mean, just last year, Providence's um, labor costs went up 10%. Our spend on drug uh, and um, medical supplies went up 13%, but reimbursement, because it's, it's lagging, is flat. And so on a slim margin business, so this is a, a unique time uh, where new reimbursement models are having to come into play. Health systems are having to find new revenue streams and are willing to listen when they can uh, because the house has been on fire for a while, but it, it is at least the doors are opening for disruption and innovation and uh, it, it is a really unique time to be here. Um, I guess I'm up next. Uh, I'm not going to tell these folks my secrets. Um, it's proprietary. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, look, at, we're interested in backing passionate teams that have experience in their relevant areas of, uh, of interest. We're interested in investing in um, companies, obviously, with big markets and, um, uh, and you know, disruptive to the provision of care at, um, that David just talked about. Specifically, the MedTech Convergence Fund, our early stage vehicle, was formed. In order to uh, exploit the convergence we saw between information technology, tech, um, connectivity, and data uh, alongside medical devices to provide holistic solutions to care, to drive down costs, um, uh, to increase access, and, and deliver ultimately better outcomes. Can I ask maybe just a question? Because I think you touched on it 
uh, interesting topic from the provider perspective. We've been talking a lot about, you know, you hear a lot about decentralization and most people's mind kind of go to blockchain and fintech and everything. But, I, you know, when we think about decentralization, you know, it's a shift to an alternative side of care. And I think that gets us excited as well as just anything that follows that trend. I mean, whether it's moving, you know, surgeries to ASCs, a lot of those kinds of things. Lou, um, are you investing in these areas and uh, I've seen this theme. I was with a facility just down the road from here. They have two chief medical officers at their hospital. One is for acute care and everything is quote unquote hospital at home. The ASC, the patient engagement at home and monitoring those patients, engaging those patients. Um, Lou, are you finding technologies that are enabling that or enabling the, the speed? from taking patients from acute care out into the uh, community? Uh, actually, we do have a couple of portfolio companies focusing on using AI to help in, uh, with patient engagement. And not only for hospital, there's even stronger demand from insurance company and also pharmaceutical company. So it's actually a very interesting model that they're not selling to the uh, patient. They're actually selling the directly getting very big contract from pharmaceutical company. And although they probably have the device as a point of care to the patient at home, but uh, they eventually become a data play. Well, let's talk about the, the data play. Um, through COVID, uh, we saw a lot of interaction between remote patient monitoring, more of the data, the transmission of that by necessity. You're not able to access the patients. You, patients weren't able to access the facilities or even their clinicians. Um, I don't say anybody gave birth to these devices overnight. They were there. I think we just didn't see a lot of use case. And now um, the clinicians were by necessity starting to trial them. Um, have you seen an acceleration in that? And have you changed the nature of your look at investing in these technologies, David? So, yes. Um, I think one of the most important uh, aspects that they can offer is patient qualification, right? So understanding what patients should get a total joint and where should they get it. Mm -hmm. um, and then engaging that patient after their care to make sure that it, it is a good outcome and that they do ha have a good experience. I, we now for the first time uh, really ever in healthcare, we have a consumer and they have a, a choice of where they go for care. Uh, and we are increasingly at risk. And so that needs to be a good experience and they need to have a good outcome. Um, but I, I don't want to over play it. I mean, I, it's okay to have a dumb device. It, it is. And I, and I think the value prop is hard enough to define and differentiate yourself that you don't need to have that distraction to create an AI or a, a big data play or um, if it's there, absolutely utilize it and try and find it where you can. But I don't think you, you, you don't, it's not a requirement. Um, we, uh, we just sold a, a business uh, called Boulder Surgical is a surgical sealer and stapler and did really well. And it, there was some data aspects of it, but in reality, it was just a great technology. And we were able to position it and, and build the value prop to navigate this, the uh, purchase committees and give the physicians what they really wanted when they needed it. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's okay. So it is, again, um, a really unique time where we're seeing a blend between digital health and these unique insights uh, and uh, just surgical tools. And if you're able to find that mix, that's great, but I wouldn't force it. Well, Greg already told us he's not gonna give anybody hints on this. So we're gonna go in a different direction, ask you a different question. Um, I wanna go back a little bit to the purpose, what we're here for. There's over 200 presenting companies. Um, you certainly can't host 200 meetings um, and nor should you because there are some that are gonna fall quite outside your theme and thesis for investing. I get asked every day, uh, David, how do I get to these people? How do we get on their desktop? How do we get their attention? Um, I think we'd love to hear from you, Greg. Um, is it from an advisor? Is it somebody that makes a friendly introduction? Capture me in two pages or I need an eight page deck so I can look at key elements. Email me, call me. Yeah. Um, Some Irish whiskey, maybe? Yeah, yeah, yeah actually, that, that always helps. Um, no, I would say the um, a warm intro is always helpful. Uh, if it's a trusted source that we know it's to some extent pre-qualified or 
at least pre-screened uh, that it, it's interesting or something that we should spend some time on. So that helps quite a bit. Um, but absent that, I mean, I think where you have to start is do research on the investors. You know, spend a little time on their website. Understand if your mission fits our mandate. Because if it doesn't, it's just not worth spending the time. It's better to be more rifle shot than it is to just kind of blast out a, a general email to lots of investors. I think you have to customize your pitch and your, your story to investors for which it's most likely to fit. Um, you know, the other thing I would recommend is that as you think about appro approaching investors, we see a lot of stuff. I mean, I get, I mean, dozens of emails a week. Mm -hmm. uh, and some days I might get a dozen a day. I spend probably three to five minutes when the deck first comes in over the transom. If I can't figure out what they do or why it's exciting, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's just I, I move on to the next thing. So uh, something that's punchy, uh, something that articulates clearly you know, the problem you're solving uh, and why that's, a, a, you know, what your, why your solution is novel and, and why it's going to be a big commercial uh, success. You know, that, that's what I need to understand almost up front. Uh, behind it, I obviously want to then look at the management team and make sure the backgrounds are suited to, to being able to deliver on the, the, on the promise. But really, I think the, the best thing you can do is really understand your audience and then uh, deliver a, a concise value proposition that's easily understood. And that is, I think, going to increase your hit rate at at least getting a 60-minute discussion, whether in this world over Zoom or um, in a conference like this, 30 minutes um, because, you know, I probably had 120 requests and I fit in somewhere between 24 and 30 meetings. Maybe I can add something to that too. I think, you know, that is kind of the curse of venture, right? I mean, it's still very much easier to get in the door if you know someone. So I think, you know, that could be frustrating. Um, one thing that Sonder has done and, you know, is set up a dedicated email address called close the gap. You can see it on the website, but for underrepresented folks in industry, you have basically a direct line to the partners who will review your, your material, will talk to you about your material, even if it's not a clear fit. Because I think one of the challenges is, since it is so referral driven, it ends up being a little bit of a closed circle, right? And so anything we can do you know, as venture capitalists to try and open that up, I think is worth doing, so. Yeah, could I add a few words? Please. Yeah, so I think the first thing, as I both mentioned, is really make sure that you have send out super concise the message because really it's hard to read such a long email in order to get the key points. <laughs> Another thing is for me personally, sometimes I even prefer founder referral versus investor referral. For example, today half of the company I met with is actually through founder referral. So we believe good founder really knows good founder. And also to, uh, to the other panel's point that really study the investor. For example, for us, also promotion that we actually have founder, ha uh, founder office hour. We have that information embedded into our website. We want to see which founder actually gonna research uh, what we're doing and also find that information, sign up for the founder office hour, be able to directly talk with my team. So that's something really worth the founder to do some study and also be able to get to know the investor. Another thing, the last one is really just a quick suggestion based on my past entrepreneur journey is when I was a founder, I hate VC <laughs> for so many different reasons. But later after I become an investor, <laughs> you know, I try to think about, okay, what is the misalignment from the both sides of the table? So I always tell founder, always use the opportunity to talk with VC as a free consulting session. Then your perspective is totally different. You are not obsessed with whether he's gonna give, he or she is going to give me money, but really focus on getting feedback, getting perspective. And also, you feel more comfortable asking help. By the end of the conversation, said, do you know anyone else I could talk to and pick their brain about how I do my company better? Because no early stage VC are expecting talking to a perfect startup company because it's impossible. But we're here to evaluate the risk and also offer help. Yeah, and, and I think just building on that, it's a partnership, right? I mean, in the end, we're your partners. If you know, as soon as you become a portfolio company, our interests are very much aligned in in creating value. And so, you know, that mentality of it's a consult free consulting that's that's a great way to think about it. Gee, Lou, that's the first time I heard anybody say I hate VC. <laughs> really, I heard so many. First time, first never time. Never heard it. Never heard it. So I was with a, a, a friend earlier today uh, who said, um, under COVID, amazing that we were able to spin out ZimV out of Zimmer Biomet um, without any interaction. People didn't see anybody. 
Talk about the investment environment under COVID, and it's not so much rear view mirror, because I'm hoping we're looking forward. We still have a little bit of a hangover and not quite out of the woods yet, but more so what changed and what you think will continue to be present in how you change and said, gee, that's a pretty good way to adapt. It's either more efficient, um, it's better for me, it's better for the companies. Greg, have you noticed a lot of change or you'll be back to the same old? Um, well, I think in terms of portfolio management, it's it's going to change very much. I don't, I don't think there's a need for quarterly board meeting. I think some of those can be done over Zoom and then obviously at least a couple times a year you want to do it in person. But I think the um, uh, I think we overvalued in-person uh, meetings, uh, particularly when there's lots of travel and inefficiency associated with it. I think we also missed something. I mean, today um, and yesterday I met with, as I said, a couple dozen companies and two thirds of them I, I don't think I'd ever heard of before. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just don't ever remember experiencing that at a conference before. And I think it's because we haven't done it for a couple of years. And, um, and so there is something missing in that regard. I would say the uh, efficiency for both me as a raiser of capital um, for, for funds, as well as for companies, I think has gotten more efficient. I think the screening call mm -hmm. Uh, in the 45 minutes or whatever it is over a Zoom it is really efficient to figure out whether or not it's worth getting together in person. Um, and so I think, uh, and it enables me, frankly, to see more opportunities right. than when, you know, uh, an executive had to come to my office. I had to make sure it was a day I was going to be there. I can meet companies when I'm traveling. I can meet companies when I'm at home or when I'm on vacation. Uh, and that's, I think that's, that's huge. The problem is we're not all connected enough to be in an ecosystem like this where you're bumping into people and seeing companies that you otherwise hadn't found you and you hadn't found them. Great, David, your experience? Not much more to add. I mean, I, it's, I miss these environments uh, and being able to interact with uh, and pass people along the way and say hi. And, and a, a lot of this job is just showing up and, and being there and being in the right place at the right time. And you have to be there in order to be at the right place at the right time. Um, and as Greg mentioned, uh, it is hard to keep track of everything that's going on uh, from your home office. When you have kids climbing over you and running into the room and uh, and you're always- Sounds like on, a personal problem. Yeah, it, it is, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it, 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 having events like these uh, are really nice and, and um, so there's there's things that have been nice uh, being able to screen a little faster and, and be a little more efficient um, but it, it, it'll be nice to go back to uh, some of the ways we did things before Lou your fund is uh, an early investor as you said um, but everybody has a different stage that they're going to invest is there anything that's really too early um, to look at and in, in other words if somebody wants to at least get on your radar, maybe it's next year that they're going to be raising a f round that could be appropriate for you, but is it a waste of time to be on your radar screen to get to know them? Is this a relationship? When I was doing M&A at the corporate level, I wanted to see companies two, three, four years beco before I was going to acquire them. I have to socialize that internally. That's a different issue, but I want to know what's coming up next and have that relationship and watch them for a while. Yeah, I, I don't think this is the same for all the early stage focus firm. But for us, we actually like to talk with founder even they think about fundraising. Because couple reasons, the first thing is same as you mentioned, we want to get to know each other. Uh, it's about partnership. It's like uh, if eventually going to get married, we need some time to date each other. And also be able to make sure this is good partnership, especially for us, most of the deal we prefer to lead serve us on, on the board, you know, this is a really important commitment for us. So even sometimes the founder just got started, they probably won't think about fundraising in another three or four months. We'd like to at least uh, put them under our radar. Sometimes we even offer help, offer suggestions. We give very honest feedback to the founder. And a couple of weeks later, we're checking to see whether founder really have the capability to integrate all this feedback and grow from there, including the introduction we give it to them, whether they were able to convert it to potential commercial you know, pipeline. So that's the metrics we've been kind of tracking as well. And uh, another reason uh, we try to talk with founder early on is also for practical reason. You know, last year Silicon Valley has been crazy in terms of the valuation. Mm -hmm. Let's be, be honest with everyone. And I was competing 
early stage deal with Sequoia, with Andreessen, with Tiger, with <laughs> Vision Fund from South Bank. So we also want to talk with founder early on to really share our knowledge about how to best structure a run and how to choose the best partner for your early stage fundraising. Then make sure they have the right expectation when they start fundraising. Andy, I see you shaking your head. Do you want to see these folks well before they might be appropriate for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think echoing everything there, you know, again, it's a partnership. It's about, you know, seeing how you can grow even in that, you know, six months, three months, who knows how long that time is. But things are so dynamic in those early stages. It's a great opportunity for us to see how you're reacting and how you're growing as an entrepreneur. And also for us to learn more about the opportunity and bring folks close to us whose opinion we also value to you know, help you out. So again, coming back, I guess, to the idea of it being a consulting project, it's free consulting, so take it. Yeah, yeah I, w I would just add that the, the biggest mistake I see companies make is they go to launch their fundraising, uh, they don't know the, the VCs, um, takes them a while to sort of line up all those meetings, it delays the fundraising process, number one. Number two, they start to learn things and their story starts to pivot mid fundraising. Yeah. Um, and that's not great, because you can't go back you know, six weeks later and say, actually we changed a bunch of things. Um, that doesn't build a lot of credibility. And so if you're out there a year before, you're building a network, number one. Number two, you're getting real feedback without asking for money. Then when you come back and see an ego maniacal um, uh, a VC like myself, they say, hey, we listened to you. Look at all the things we did, because you're so smart. You know, it's a, it's a good conversation to, it's a more positive conversation to have than to come in and have me just critique it and feel like, you know, we're, we're not aligned. Is it a negative when people change a little bit of the track or their story? Um, because I see people that, as you're saying, you're always going to learn something else and things do change as you go along. And some people are afraid to say, well, I said this was my plan before and now I've changed. Yeah, it's just, I would say if it's, you know, within the period of a specific fundraising, it looks a little whipsaw and, you, you know, you're not prepared to really execute. If it's you're getting that feedback a year in advance, you've really thought it through, you've done additional research and you come with a more comprehensive story um, that reflects some of that feedback, I think you're just going to have better success and look, look more prepared to, to execute, which builds investor confidence. Great. <laughs> David, uh, let's shift a little bit here. Um, we're talking about how you're looking at things. Um, on the flip side, are there areas or segments that have completely lost your interest in the last few years or looking out for that was hot before? I'm not going to touch anything. I hate to say a particular clinical segment. I'll get beer thrown at me. I, but you can try. Yeah. I <laughs> Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. I, I think maybe a little differently. I get excited about things and I think all of us are on this, in this job because we get excited about things and we want to see, uh, advancements in care. And so I do try to go contrarian. Um, but it, it's harder nowadays because there is a, um, more capital on the sideline than any time in history, uh, all geared toward healthcare. Um, and so it, it, which is great, right? I mean, when we saw the power of what resources and the entrepreneurial spirit can do in this country when we created a vaccine in 12 months, right? And got it out to millions of people in no time, right? I mean, that is a, a miracle. And within 24 hours, everybody across the world had the DNA makeup of the virus, which is remarkable, right? And so um, getting to see uh, where I think modern medicine has failed, which is, uh, disparities in care, behavioral health, women's health. Uh, there's a there is some in getting those areas the resources. I, there will be a lot of failures, but there will also be a, a lot of great success there. So um, again, I'm excited about it. Um, I do look more contrarian. Uh, I do just to try to follow whatever Greg does, and uh, <laughs> and it seems to work. <coughs> I was, uh, I was reviewing some Silicon Valley bank data um, and MedTech came back very strong for investing. Um, when I looked at the last few years, the core device diagnostics was um, stable. That's my polite way of saying, or optimistic way of saying flat. 
David, we'll be optimistic, um, but a huge amount into the health IT area. Um, and I'm not talking EMRs, real device-based um, technologies that are gonna be applicable. But we didn't see a lot of exits. The good side on that, though, I didn't see a, a lot of failures either. The companies were continuing to operate and get funded. Does this look too long of a cycle to you, or is it okay? Uh, are you seeing trends that why they're taking a long time to exit, Greg? Um, I think part of the reason money's flowing back into the medtech segment is we had an IPO window open for a couple of years, and that also held the, um, a viable alternative to the strategic, so that also helps M&A and... Uh, we saw medtech multiples at all-time highs. I mean, mm -hmm. double all-time highs. So some of that will come back to normal. Um, I think um, growth stage medtech, uh, there will continue to be interest. Uh, these are companies that, you know, have their approvals. They're, you know, growing pretty predictably. Um, and I think, um, I, I think that's durable. Early stage is always going to be more volatile. I think you said, you know, MedTech kind of stabilized. It's called hitting rock bottom mm -hmm. um, in terms of the amount of money that was flowing. I'm very excited that it's coming back. In addition to a positive exit environment, the other reason is just the potential of some of these technologies that the other panelists talked about in terms of moving care towards the home and other disruptive modalities, which are, um, you know, huge economic um, opportunities. Uh, that just didn't exist. I talked to some companies today that talked about uh, computing power, uh, processing power, you know, using diagnostics that five years ago wouldn't have been possible. Right. Uh, we have a level of connectivity that's making things possible that didn't exist, you know, five years ago. Um, so there are just, uh, there's innovations in battery technology. There, there are things that the med tech industry is utilizing that um, I think will create a renaissance in uh, the types of opportunities we invest in. They may not be, you know, the next mitral valve. Um, so it'll, the med tech industry will look a little more diverse, um, but it, it's, it's no less med tech. Um, there'll be regulated medical devices driving real outcomes. And I think as others said before, for the first time, these devices will also be collecting real data, uh, which is a treasure trove of, of value itself. And do you get a ton of diversity in approaches to you as well? Trends or issues uh, along the lines of uh, IT, health, technologies? Yeah, there's probably a lot of ways to peel that apart. I mean, I think, you know, if we speak health IT specifically, you know, there, there has been, it's, it's a more accessible area of healthcare for a lot of folks that might not be as versed in healthcare. And so I think that might have something to do with it. You have some investors that are coming into the space that, you know, um, you know, let's see how that plays out in the long run. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you know, this idea of enabling technologies and what they've been able to do for med tech, there's, you know, there's the integration of technology into the device itself. But I mean, I look at one of our portfolio companies, one of our first portfolio companies that we got excited about uses, you know, 3D scanning, 3D modeling, 3D printing, like, you know, laser cutting, all these technologies that are around and they've been around for a while, not necessarily brand new, but you can put these together in interesting ways to create devices that, yeah, you look at the end product and you're like, okay, well, that's cool. But it's actually really fascinating, the technology development from other areas that have gone into it. And I think you combine that with the, you know, the, the structural changes in healthcare. I, I mean, I agree, absolutely. This is like a very exciting time to be, to be doing this, so. I really want to echo that because that's also one of our mandate that how to bring the technology from the tech sector to the healthcare sector mm -hmm. and lots of great opportunity. Because for us, we're not only investing in healthcare, we invest in deep tech as well. I was invest a lot of edge computing company initially and later we found, okay, besides AI, edge computing for healthcare is important because we have huge amount of data. We need to make sure there's no latency to have live you know, processing uh, capability. And meanwhile, okay, data privacy is important for healthcare, federal learning for healthcare data. That's another thing. And when we talk about the hardware, how about the nano robot application for healthcare? That's also create lots of new opportunity. And then we have this new type of uh, flexible electronic sensor. Also had amazing applications, 3D printing, like uh, 3D metal printing, new material. I'm a material scientist from Stanford, so I saw lots of great tech solution be able to apply to healthcare and also leverage the huge amount of uh, high quality data we're generating in healthcare to create a new solution. So that's 
that's a really, really exciting, we call it interdiscipline type of innovation. We're investing and also in power. Yeah, I'd also say pure med tech, uh, there's procedure data, there's, it's, you can back into a market size, right? And if I'm an acquirer and I have to put my job on the line on saying, I wanna buy this and I wanna put our money in and this is my name on it, I can feel comfortable in presenting how I got to that market size and why I'm gonna pay that value. When you mix in the IT and the digital health side of it too, you get into that gray area where it's really hard to predict the market size. And I think we've seen uh, a lot of companies misjudge that, a lot of investors misjudge that um, and market sizes in, in healthcare can vary uh, and can be deceiving. And, and when you're having to, we have to convince somebody at a certain level. I mean, if I'm selling something for a hundred million bucks, I mean, that's a rounding error for a lot of companies and no one's gonna put their job on the line for it, it right? No one's gonna lose their job for doing that. That's risk that they can take. Once you get higher up, when we're talking about these market sizes that are a little gray, uh, take a little more convincing. Somebody has to say, I'm all in on this and, and this is why, and they have to present it to their board and, and convince somebody. So that's that's where it gets into that gray area where I think we're still trying to figure it out because the, the market is changing, the market's moving. And so I, I think we are gonna see it, but we also will see how badly we misjudged uh, as investors, as entrepreneurs in the next couple of years, so. You brought up Tam. Let's ask a really basic question, but I get asked this every time. When, when I was reviewing companies, um, it seemed that you, everybody felt that they had to put a billion dollar TAM or they couldn't even talk to an investor. Um, how do you look at TAM in a couple different regards? Because I would always whittle it down to say, you can tell me you have a billion dollar TAM, but a third of those patients are not gonna be eligible. They're not applicable here. I wanna get to the real applicable population. I want to ask that, and then the second part of that is, if you're going to be in a billion dollar market with only two players versus a two billion dollar market with 10 players, how are you fairly evaluating these companies? Because I get a lot of consternation from people say, how do I approach these people when it looks like I'm not so excited at $600 million, but this is novel and I'm the only one that's going to enter this market. Lou? Sure, I think that's also kind of relate to uh, sometimes we wanted to share knowledge from VC side to let the founder understand why we have this type of requirement for market size. Because we also need to consider our fund potential return. For example, I did a medical device company. My merger acquisition exit for my company is uh, roughly $100 million. But when I start to run the $100 million fund, if I only have a company exit with $100 million, I own 10% of it, it won't return majority of my fund. That's the kind of the challenge for a VC running a couple hundred million dollar fund. We have to look for a billion dollar exit in order to make sense for us to invest and eventually generate good return from the fund level. So that's the essential fundamental metrics we're, we're calculating when we're looking at market size, market opportunity. Per your second part of the questions, if it's the okay, half a billion dollar market size, a really novel technology, eventually it's a half a billion dollar exit. It just, uh, you know, really want to support, but I need to consider the fund return. So that's the difference between the individual investor, angel investor, and the, and the professional institutionalized the VC. And uh, another thing is to your first part of questions, we definitely want to see honest number from funder in terms of calculation for TAM. Another thing is, trust me, all the investors, we're gonna do our own due diligence. The first thing we're gonna do is market analysis. We're gonna calculate our own TAM. If we saw the big gap between our TAM data versus funder's number, that's a negative signal already. Yeah, absolutely. I think the honesty piece, and again, coming back to the idea of it being a partnership, it's gonna come up now or later if you're you know, not being really genuine about that TAM that you're addressing. So just you know, do some work on it. Make sure, validate it, check it with others. And then I think, you know, from a Sonder perspective, when we think about TAM and I think, you know, fund return, you know, there's a multi-component thing when you're thinking about fund return. And there are situations where maybe it is a smaller TAM, maybe it is a smaller opportunity, but, you know, you can make up some of that through ownership or, or other ways. So I think, you know, there's ways to think about how you build a business and also how you construct a fund portfolio. Sometimes in a fund's portfolio, you want some quick flips that might be smaller you know, TAMs at the end of the day. So what it comes down to is alignment of interests and 
the TAM has to be a critical piece of that and being accurate as much as you can. Greg, ditto or anything else to add? Um, well, one, I, I totally agree with the credibility point and, okay, you can show me what the total addressable market is. I really like it when you can segment it down to what the total accessible market is and be realistic about it. Um, I'm willing to look at markets that are 200, 250 million, but the rule of thumb is you better be able to get to an exit on less than $20 million invested. If you've got a, you know, 500 to a billion dollar exit, 500 million to a billion dollar exit potential, yeah, those are segments where you can invest more heavily. It can cost more to get to market because you've got a, a higher top end. And just when I look broadly at, out there, typically a company's exit price is capped at what the total accessible market is. It kind of, it reads pretty closely. Right. So as you're thinking about, okay, do I have a good value proposition for an investor? You should be thinking about that 10 times difference between what is it going to cost you to get to an exit? If it's, you know, if the, if the accessible market is 10 times that, then you're probably in a safe zone. If it exceeds that, then you've got a, probably a very interesting value proposition. Great perspective. One of the biggest questions I get asked when people are trying to put together their deck. I, be, be honest too, because hey, you're not going to change the market side. It, it is what it is, and you're going to figure it out pretty quickly. And uh, back of the envelope, I, I say if it's a $200 million market, that somebody's going to pay $100 million for it if you dominate that market. And so then you have to back into the cap cost of capital that you're raising and, and making sure everybody does well at $100 million at, uh, at that, that point. I love the smaller markets. I think they usually have a, a big med tech asleep at the wheel, and you can just clean... Uh, their clock just and dominate them and uh, and the, and again the acquirers they, they're not going to put their job on the line they don't have to worry about it it's a rounding error for them and it's a tuck in uh, particularly when that division is getting creamed um, mm -hmm. so I, but again it, you have to be honest with the market size you can't change that and it is it's going to be what it is um, you can grow it you can eventually but not in a uh, investment horizon that we've are beholden to so yeah, the only other thing I'd add is that as I think about it a little more is that if you have a multi-billion dollar market there's gonna be dozens of players yep. right mm -hmm. I mean there's right. people are gonna find it interesting um, so at, at that point it comes down to the real novelty of the product mm -hmm. um, and so we do get worried about busy markets there's only so many buyers but if you've got a novel solution that you know delivers a an outsized outcome or economic proposition then th that can differentiate itself you started to talk about exits. Um, I always looked at it as a game of Texas Hold'em poker. How many outs do you have? And sometimes there could be 20, 30 players that could acquire it. And I mean, if you're a structural heart, you might have four or five. Um, did the exit opportunities really concern you a lot? Um, I, I don't think I've seen a deck where somebody didn't say Boston Psy, Medtronic, J&J. &J. <laughs> And, and striker um, as the exit. Well, you know they do maybe five to ten deals on a good year. We have two hundred presenting companies here, so we, we know the math of what the exits are going to look like. But are the number of exit opportunities really a concern for you? Yeah, I mean that's part of the reason we um, ten years ago moved to later stage. There's just fewer buyers, uh, harder to predict. Uh, but if you get a company to 30 to 50 million in revenue, you've got a lot of options, whether it's M&A or IPO market. And so I want to invest in companies that are got 10 to 15 and kind of fund them for three to five years and, and get to an outcome. Um, so I think that's problematic. Um, I would say in the early stage and part of the themes that everyone on the panel talked about around, um, you know, how medical devices is changing and why some of the opportunities around connected devices and uh, moving towards the home and uh, consumer product versus, you know, health tech versus med tech. All that's really interesting because it increases the number of buyers. All of a sudden, you're not beholden necessarily to yeah. just Medtronic in Boston. Um, you may have a, a company that could be interesting to an Amazon or a Google or an Apple. Yeah, a lot I, of head shaking down the line. Go yeah, ahead, but David. My, my North Star is you want to build a business to be bought, not sold, right? And so you need to be making decisions to build a great business and growth is hard to find execution solves all problems uh, most problems and uh, in the end if you build a good business somebody will buy it i mean we try to do our math on the front end uh, and make sure that they're it's strategically in the right direction and who might be around the hoop and um, and make sure that there's multiple shots on goal but 
in the end, you, you want to be bought, right? You don't want to build a business just to sell. And that's, that comes through in all the decisions that you're making and the time horizon that you're beholden to uh, and those short-term decisions. So it's just something I always try to advise my entrepreneurs that I work with uh, as they're contemplating what decision to make and some of the, the harder ones. Uh, that's just something I always use. So. Yeah. So yeah. Same. Same here. I think sometimes people think okay, earlier stage is way too early to think about exit, but actually it's a part of a very important part of our due diligence is exit analysis to understand okay, what is the potential exit route for this company we're evaluating? Merge acquisition. Who are the potential buyer? What is the potential price range if they achieve what they acclaim? And also any opportunity for potential IPO. Besides that, another thing we did is even at earlier stage we actually create a CXO network. Now we. We have 44 executives, uh, mainly CTO from Global One Southern Company. One third are healthcare, like CTO from Mechanic, uh, senior VP from United Health. Then we also frequently discuss with them to understand, okay, if they're gonna buy, which type of company they want to buy, and uh, what are the uh, new information we could heard from them about their budget for buying company. I think the good news to you guys is what I heard recently from all the CTO is they got empowered, more empowered uh, by their board for potential integrate new technology into the corporate. So we integrate that information to our due diligence and also share that with founder to better consider their potential exit route. Yeah, I don't know if I have a lot more to add other than from a Sonder perspective, I think we also bias ourselves towards new categories as opposed to something a little bit more incremental, which I think just adds to the optionality when you think about the exit opportunities there. So definitely something that we're keeping in mind you know, from the beginning, um, but we also kind of bias ourselves towards those opportunities with optionality. Thanks. One of the biggest head scratchers I came across today were people actually building their deck in the last page they're asking me do we put the revenue projection in and, and some people said i was told absolutely don't some are saying i can't go there unless i show them what my revenue is going to look like um and i've seen it um both ways i've got a certain opinion but i'm just an advisor i want to hear from you guys and david you're shaking your head a lot too yeah, um, I, goldilocks That's, i mean like not, not too aggressive, not too conservative, just, uh, just a decent uptick uh, in reasons. I mean, we're going to dive into the assumptions behind it, so, and we're going to haircut it uh, and build our own. But as long as the assumptions make sense, and that's really where I focus my time and attention, because that helps me get into the mindset of how you're attacking, what are the inputs, uh, what are the, the factors that drive growth that maybe inhibit it. So that's it. it I, just Goldilocks is. Greg, does it look strange if somebody, um, like you were saying, you advise them, they get smarter along the way? Six months ago, you told me year three was going to be $30 million. Now it's $60 million. What gives here? Yeah, no, that, I think that's a problem. Um, and so I, th I, I like the approach that David just articulated. I think, um, look, at, I, I also think the ramp's highly dependent on how much money you're going to invest, right? I mean, how aggressively you're going to invest in that commercial ramp. Um, and so that that can change. You know, I think the articulation of what the assumptions are, why you can capture share, probably the best thing you can put in the deck versus kind of this, you know, uh, finger in the air revenue projections. If there's a predicate you can map to and say, well, this is how this product, similar market, you know, uh, similar sort of entry point, uh, how that went, and we're thinking we have that sort of potential, that to me is one of the best things you can do. Well said. Andy. Yeah, I think if I'm going to open up somebody's revenue project projection, I'm not looking at the numbers. I'm looking at the cells that show the actual assumptions that are driving the equation. So, Probably add on to that. I think, as David mentioned, mindset is very important because we want to understand the logic, how fund their actual analysis and also plan ahead for their future growth. Another thing related to that, we typically want to combine the revenue projection together with their fundraising plan, whether it makes sense for how much money they plan to raise for a Series A, B, C stage, compared with the, their revenue projection. And the, on the other side, you know, don't be too nervous about the exact number you put it there because 90% of the time, eventually that number will be wrong. 100, 100% <laughs> of the time. Okay. I can guarantee you. It. And ours is gonna be wrong too, so. I don't know, I've seen some that say zero that are pretty accurate, at least for a few years. <laughs> Great, well, as Nick introduced me, uh, I'd been 25 years uh, prior, prior to an advisor 
as a strategic, um, I get asked every day, and I get some people that are afraid to, and some people that are asking me to make introductions to 10 strategics. Let's get into the topic of strategic investors. Don't like it, want them at a certain point, would love to have them there to validate. Don't know what that is. Um, so in our early stage fund, we actually have a, um, a corporate that is the uh, sole LP. So and they're in the audience, so I love strategics. Uh, no, I, um, look, at, I think uh, we have them in our funds, uh, not only in the MedTech fund. We have six of the, probably the world's top 15 pharmaceutical companies invested in our biotech uh, vehicles. We work very well with strategics, both investors in our funds and partnering in companies. I think the data, I haven't looked at in a long time, um, I think the data shows that companies with strategic investors earlier tend to do better. The actual, the buyer is not correlated at all with who that strategic investor is, but they tend to be bought more frequently and they tend to be bought for bigger multiples. I think that's held, held true. There's something to the early validation of a strategic seeing how this could be disruptive to their business, that they want to have a seat at the table uh, or room, what we call a room with a view. Um, that I think is I think is really helpful, and I think it excites at least an investor like me that to see some of that validation from a perspective by or somebody who's very knowledgeable about the space. I find a really good attorney first, right? And there are pitfalls, and all of us have scars and have learned. I think as you turn the page, though, it it does and it, uh, provide a lot of value, a lot of credibility. But you, it goes back to you want to be bought, not sold, right? And so when you bring that strategic into the room as an advisor, they're influencing the decisions as an entrepreneur that you're making. And so do you invest in that R&D? Do you invest in uh, the strategic direction that you think the market's going? Or are you answering to that specific strategic, which can have an impact on your outcome? And so I, as an example, I was uh, investing in a business called Varen Medical. Uh, it's a lung navigation business, and we um, took a, a large note from uh, a company called BTG. Um, and in that note, it was able to be converted into equity, um, and they had an option to acquire us at a set price uh, with a set timeline. So uh, we paid a lot of money for a very good uh, attorney, but it turns out Boston Scientific Stop. came in and bought BTG, and they didn't use that that. Um, they didn't exercise their right to acquire. And so had the entrepreneur who was a great Audience. entrepreneur, we had a great board, had we built and listened to everything that they were saying that they wanted to see, we would have been lost, right? But because they were thinking more around how do we build a great business and how do we position ourselves to where the market's going and be strategically unique, um, Olympus came in and bought the business and paid a lot more than what we had originally signed up for. So. Uh, just something to keep in mind and, and again as you're thinking through what's the best decision for the business you have to think about that and be mindful because that, that decision tree becomes blurred at that point in time. Different perspectives same? Yeah I think I'd probably echo the same comments you know I think they can be you, you have to manage it carefully but yeah. Very good. Um, Nick, uh, if you're going to forward the audience for a question or two, or if we're a wrap, uh, I'll let you make that decision. I haven't seen the time. We're winding down, but we have one burning desire for a burning question. Anybody in the audience want to raise a hand and ask our panelists anything we have uh, in the back there? Yeah, so my question is, with inflation going up, how do you view that as potentially, oh, so I don't have to scream. Um, with the changes in the economy and inflation, how do you think that's going to change the fundraising environment in the next 12 months? Um, it's a good question. So I've got some companies that set a plan, um, you know, third, fourth quarter last year, uh, planning to raise this year. And we've just seen CRO costs go up. We've seen cost, labor costs are going up. So, you know, I think the reality is you just need to, uh, you're going to have to raise more uh, than you thought previously. Um, and I would say, um, while the debt markets continue to be really robust, shockingly, eventually the music's going to stop there too. Um, so as I was say, I've said to some of my companies that are here and, and, uh, and some that are not, um, you know, if people are passing out hors d'oeuvres right now, take one. <laughs> like, you know, you have equity capital available to you, take it. You have debt capital available to you, take it. Uh, because I do think... Um, 
we're probably moving into an environment where um, that incremental dilution um, is going to um, probably prevent you from hitting a uh, hitting a bump in the road in terms of running into a situation where there, you might not have enough capital and the fundraising market may not be as uh, uh, robust as frankly it is right now, despite everything going on. Well, there we go. Nick, would you like to close it out? I'd like to, first of all, say this has been the fifth investor panel I've done uh, this year and this was the most insightful by far. So thank you very much and uh, like the audience to uh, thank the panelists here.